Okay, everybody, I assume you can hear me 100%. Today is going to be our last lecture of International Tax and Tax Treaties class. And uh, we're fortunate to have Professor Kleinfeld doing a great topic of audit techniques um, from the Revenue Authorities. As some class announcements we're going to need. Um, for those of you who are following the Career Services course, you still have three more lectures in December. Check the course calendar. The course calendar. That's the That's email blast that is sent out from Career Services. Out with some career services. One of those lectures is KPMG. Lectures Another is KPMG. like Ernst and Young. Another anyway, go in there and you'll anyway, go in there and you'll see those from the uh, from the big firms. You'll see those from the and then and then then the uh, then the. Uh, um, uh, for those of you who have uh, assignments to do for your right with your classes and so forth, classes and so forth, make sure that make sure that if you're not going to meet a deadline, meet a deadline, touch base with your instructor. You don't touch base, but you will be able to help you later. They're just going to give you an F. You just got to tell them I can't turn it in now. Tell them I can't turn it in now. Give date you're going to turn it in. I'm leaving on I'm Sunday, leaving and I won't be Sunday back. And I won't be back until uh, January. I'll be gone to Brazil. I will be out of touch. So please, if you're going to be late on your assignments, make sure that you organize that. Organize that with the instructor or Hester. Hester. And you don't wait until after the grades are submitted. After the grades are submitted. Okay, I'm going to turn off my microphone okay, turn and I'm going to turn it over to Professor Kleinfeld. Turn it over to Professor Kleinfeld. Okay, I assume everybody can uh, hear me okay? Other than there's a terrible echo on Professor Burns. Okay, okay, good guys. Um, what we're going to do is maybe talk about something that's, uh, that has been discussed previously in treaties courses, uh, but I, what we felt was, was always been important. Uh, is the fact of what happens when the Internal Revenue Service uh, gets involved in an international uh, transaction, particularly was related to treaties. Um, and that's where the actual tire hits the road. And I think that sometimes uh, practitioners are surprised uh, that uh, merely citing some uh, part of the law uh, isn't good enough for the Internal Revenue Service or other revenue authorities, and that they like to have a significant amount of uh, information and uh, have uh, and, and, and then themselves uh, have pre-established uh, procedures, uh, limitations as well as uh, uh, guidelines on how they are to proceed. This is particularly true with the Internal Revenue Service, uh, which is highly organized. And you can find when you uh, run a check on uh, what the Internal Revenue Service agents are supposed to supposed to do, uh, they're told what forms to fill out. What information goes on the form? Uh, when they use, uh, uh, even if they use a, 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 a supplemental page, they're told when that has to be an IRS form or even a blank page, size of it, and so on. Uh, for those who, uh, I'm not going to go into all the revenue authorities. I'd just like to give you uh, some idea about the the United States. Uh, maybe most of you have don't really understand how the. Let's just start with something practical. How, that is how the uh, Internal Revenue Service is organized. Uh, there has been a, a reorganization in which there was a just a, a, a mind-boggling complexity of, of little boxes and connections that the IRS had as their chart. Uh, they have uh, somewhat simplified that approach so that uh, we have a commissioner, and then off the commissioner there's various uh, departments, uh, chief counsel, appeals, uh, but as, as more appropriate to what we're looking about, Coming off the commissioner, there's a, a deputy commissioner of services and enforcement. And under that, under the deputy commissioner of services and enforcement, uh, enforcement uh, there's seven different little uh, boxes, little groups that they're organized in. The two that really relate to uh, what we're doing, uh, which will have unusual names, but you'll see these pop up 
in IRS correspondence, and if you look at their guidelines, procedural guidelines, you'll see these pop up. Uh, one is called the Large and Mid-Sized Business. That's uh, LMSB. You'll see that LMSB. And the other is the Small Business Self-Employed, the SBSE. So you'll see these terms used regularly in designating uh, these two groups, uh, which is how the IRS is now organized into looking at things in large and mid-sized businesses, and then otherwise they're looking at uh, small business or self-employed people. On the, um, on the management structure, uh, what you'll see is on, let's just take the large mid-sized business structure, there's five levels of IRS personnel. So you have an LMSB commissioner on one level, then comes an industry director because they're divided up in different industries now. Then you have a field operations director. And op then you have a territorial manager. And under them is a team manager. Used to be called a group supervisor. Then they're called then a group manager. Now they're called team manager. IRS are now part of a team. And then finally get down to where our level uh, where the usually hits is when we're talking to a revenue agent or a, a uh, revenue specialist. So we're looking, uh, going up and down the stream with five different levels of people who get involved in these various procedural parts of the uh, of the uh, of dealing with the uh, um, international arena. Uh, the manual itself, the IRS really follows along with uh, two basic uh, chapters. One that deals with procedures, uh, and, and this deals with uh, exchange information. Uh, procedures dealing with the mutual agreement procedures and reporting, tax treaty and related matters, the tax treaties, uh, the large and mid-sized business international program itself, how you classify international uh, features on their tax returns, uh, the international referral criteria, that is, how, if an agent sees a return, and how, what, what the criteria is that they suddenly decide to pick that return up and, and, and audit it. So these two areas are, I think, quite uh, quite important. That is the the classification of returns as they come into a service center, what service center it may be, um, and and how that actually works. Um, after the international referral criteria, they have guidelines for evaluating returns, uh, the international examination and processing returns, and then uh, how an international a a a agent. Um, examination agent uh, writes his report. There's, it's a very specialized, very specific method of how the reports and what has to go into those reports. So it's not just offhand stream of consciousness. Uh, the internal revenue service specifies every agent how they're going to write the reports and, the, and then what subjects go in order uh, so that every report comes out basically the same, although obviously it'll vary as to the uh, writing ability and intelligence and knowledge of, of the individual agent. After the, after the chapter on procedures, there's the audit guidelines, which are critical in the, in the treaty area. Uh, we have four, you know, because if you're dealing with treaties, what, how does the Internal Revenue Service go about uh, accessing foreign books and records? They have chapters on that. Specifically, the longest chapter of, 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 of that the IRS deals with the one they spend the most time on is uh, developing uh, for a sec what's called Section 482 cases. That's intercompany pricing. This is the big bugaboo for the for the revenue authorities worldwide of all the industrial countries, all the OECD countries. Uh, it used to be that uh, the internal revenue that the, the United States was the only one complaining, saying that people were holding money in foreign countries and not paying the tax in the United States because it was cheaper for them to keep the money in the foreign countries. Now, as uh, other countries uh, are building up their their, uh, their their tax system and their tax enforcement system, uh, you find that uh, uh, countries such as Brazil are now uh, raising uh, their, their 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 ire over the fact that the, that too much income is being allocated to the United States, and thereby they're avoiding sort of Brazilian taxes or French taxes or German taxes. So there's a battle going on between the that the taxpayers are caught in between uh, because the intercompany pricing uh, may look at uh, profit in two different ways, and then you have revenue authorities will be uh, allocating profit, uh, which might be a lot more than the actual profit of, of the of, of, of the company. 
So it's a difficulty, and uh, then getting the competent authorities between the countries to negotiate this uh, based on some theoretical concept of intercompany pricing uh, becomes a lot more complicated at that. So they have development of 42 cases, which is probably the biggest area for guidelines for uh, international agents. Uh, there's guidelines for information gathering, how to classify entities, uh, and then there's, 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 there's specific areas that the agents are told how to go into, which is the international boycott area. I think this is uh, something that Marshall I. Langer, uh, Professor Langer and I have uh, discussed at various times. It's always interesting how the Internal Revenue Service and, and, and the Congress is very concerned uh, in, in, in about uh, companies boycotting, uh, for example, Israel. Uh, and we have special code vision there, but however, uh, probably the, the companies which are the greatest violator are on the list. And certainly uh, the, this area is, has not been fairly heavily enforced, uh, as it seems that our policy. There's also discussions of controlled foreign corporations and all the other topics under there, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, this, this, uh, possessions corporations, which uh, most of you may not be, uh, not e almost ever deal with. However, it should be recognized that, uh, that, that I think that, uh, uh, as Professor Langer has pointed out to me uh, you know, a number of times, uh, the United States treaties uh, do not extend uh, to use in the U.S. possessions, although the U.S. possessions in return uh, must comply with, uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the Internal Revenue Service in requests. So it's a one-way street. Uh, there are some uses uh, for uh, possessions in terms of international tax planning. Uh, treaties are not necessarily one of them. Uh, foreign tax credits, uh, and then a topic called uh, transfers to foreign corporations. It's always a surprise sometimes to people that if you have transfers of a property, or whether tangible or intangible, uh, to a, uh, from, from, from the United States to a foreign corporation, a foreign corporation back in the United States, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an Apple code section. So these assets are not freely transferable back and forth. They do incur income tax. Uh, possibly, and then the last, which is the, uh, which is a, the topic for a, 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 several lectures into itself, called uh, is the FERPTA, so which is the Foreign Investment Real Estate Property Tax Act. My only comment about that was, as we've seen, that came in uh, a, a number of years ago because the Congress was concerned that uh, particularly people from the Middle East were going to buy up all the farm country and thereby control the food supply of the United States. Uh, that never happened. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, FERC, the Foreign Investment Real Estate Property Tax Act, uh, continued on, and uh, it has been a, uh, a major impediment to foreign investment into the United States real estate, which previous to this may not have been as great a problem. It's always been a problem. But now, as we're trying to seek foreign investment, uh, FERC uh, stands as, a, as one of the, maybe not the highest barrier, but certainly a barrier to getting foreign money to come into the United States at a time when the United States uh, desperately needs more foreign investment. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's discuss uh, uh, topic number one, the exchange of information. Uh, the exchange of information articles, I think as you just give a gloss again, there's a general obligation on the part of competent authorities to exchange information. Uh, that's for purposes of carrying out the treaty, for treaties. There's a restriction on the use and disclosure of information that's received. That is, uh, uh, generally, we will, uh, the Privacy Act in, in, in the United States, that information should not be readily available. Uh, once, it's, once it's transmitted into the Internal Revenue Service, it's supposed to be treated confidential, and uh, except for some access by a uh, by, uh, congressional committee and by a Senate Finance Committee, which the Senate from the Ask Committee hasn't had an oversight, has had one oversight of the IRS, I think about 25 years, uh, the information is not disseminated anywhere. Uh, there's language in the exchange information articles which relieves the competent authorities of any obligation to provide information which is not attainable or which uh, under the other country's administrative provisions would be at variance uh, with the laws of the requesting country or would disclose trade secrets or other information which may, might be contrary to the public policy uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the other country. So uh, these provisions, together with the Code Section 6103, uh, actually 6103K4, if I recall right, 
allow the U.S. competent authority and officials who've been delegated to carry out their functions um, and to uh, deal with U.S. treaties, tax information exchange agreements, uh, to disclose tax information, tax returns uh, to a foreign treaty partner or her delegates. Uh, for your purposes to know who you're dealing with, the U.S. competent authority for purposes of exchange information is the director international of the large and medium uh, sized business. It's, it's very important that you understand that who has authority to a revenue service to sign agreements and to uh, enter into uh, various understandings with the other country's competent authorities. That is, I have, we've had cases, and, and Professor Langer's had cases, uh, where we've had uh, uh, agreements signed by a revenue service agents or by a territorial manager or somebody, uh, and then later on it was then uh, refuted uh, by higher ups in the Internal Revenue Service, uh, at which they have, are allowed to do because uh, there are only certain designated persons who are allowed to sign these uh, these sort of agreements. And uh, so it's important to know that when you're, when you're having an agreement signed, uh, for example, an advanced pricing agreement or something, uh, uh, that you have the, the actual person who is authorized to sign it is the person signing, and not just somebody from the Internal Revenue Service who may just sign it as a matter of convenience or may not uh, you have the information to know that someone higher up in the, in the food chain has to hire it, has to sign it. Um, generally, some treaties and the tax information exchange agreements uh, describe the types of exchange information, uh, but, they, uh, uh, but they do not generally limit the form that the exchange information may take. Uh, that is, that there can be a request from one competent authority to another, or uh, it can be spontaneous such as when the information has not been specifically requested. So most exchange information programs have two aspects, that's outgoing and then incoming. So when you look at it, uh, you, you, have the, you have various types of exchange information programs. One is the routine, routine exchange information. So this is essentially a spontaneous exchange information uh, insofar as the information is not generally specifically requested, uh, but uh, when a treaty or TIEA uh, enters into force, um, uh, it generally agrees that the information will be exchanged on a routine basis. So uh, this is sometimes referred to as the uh, the automatic exchange of information program. Uh, it includes information that's given on forms 1042s's, for example, relating to U.S. source fixed or determinable income. Uh, paid to persons claiming to be res residents of, rec of a, a receiving treaty country. Uh, generally, the information the IRS provides and information the IRS receives uh, from the other revenue authorities consists of uh, thousands of records uh, which are exchanged by way of magnetic media, which is either right now tapes or disks. Uh, those records are processed generally at the Layup Service Center or sometimes at the Martinsburg Computing Center, uh, depending whether the the exchange is incoming or outgoing. So the primary applications of the program are in the are in the area, as I talked, the procedural area, which is in the returns processing. In addition to routine exchange, there's also specific exchange information. That's a separate program, and it's also known as the uh, the exchange information uh, upon request. And this involves coordination of both incoming and outgoing requests as to specific taxpayers, not in general. They, have to, they identify specifically who they're asking information for. Uh, these requests generally arise because there's been an examination of a particular tax return, and uh, the requests uh, may also uh, come in because of uh, collection uh, activities or because of a, of a criminal investigation. Mostly these are handled by the IRS tax uh, attaché, was formerly re referred to as the Revenue Service, Internal Revenue Service representative. Uh, the Exchange Information Program, uh, there are analysts in the Office of Director, International Large and Mid-Sized Small Business, uh, which handles the incoming and outgoing requests, which involve uh, Canada and France. And there are cases where someone needs to be prepared to secure the information requested by a treaty partner. Uh, the work to obtain the information uh, for a treaty partner is done in by the IRS field offices, uh, which is 
and then uh, directed uh, under the direction of a exchange of information team or the uh, the uh, IRS tax attaché, uh, who then prepares the necessary for the necessary uh, competent authority correspondence to legally disclose and then transmits the information once it's been vetted uh, to the treaty partner. So what you don't see uh, is the fact that someone just automatically, uh, some agent may pick up a return, pick up a telephone call, and call uh, the revenue authority in Germany and say, hey, by the way, I got, uh, I have uh, this tax return, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Robert, Robert, on the, uh, I got his return, and guess what? What I found, it, it, it doesn't work like that. There's a there's a whole hierarchy of procedures you have to go through to vet all this information, and the very formal procedure on how it's exchanged. Uh, there's also what's called an industry-wide exchange information program. Uh, these involve meetings between the U.S. and treaty partner. It may be between the examination branch. It could be by, between the criminal investigation branch. Uh, these uh, ex industry exchanges do not involve uh, uh, specific taxpayers. And that it, what they really involve is an exchange of information uh, dealing with um, uh, trends, what's going on, what, 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 what structures people are putting, what transactions are being done, uh, operating practices, pricing policies, know-how, experience, uh, Lots of practical stuff is done in these uh, industry-wide exchanges, uh, dealing with uh, particular industries or economic se sectors. There's an exchange information team, program uh, analyst who works with the field personnel, the IRS tax attaché, uh, and foreign officials, and then they arrange these meetings. There are, so you're aware of, uh, not only meetings between the high level, but there are meetings constantly at these mid-level mid uh, of, of various revenue authorities from, uh, from uh, various countries, and they have separate uh, associations of, uh, of, of tax uh, revenue authorities of government where they meet outside of the government contests through their associations. These are formal associations. We have, uh, like Marshall, I have been members of the International Tax Planning Association for, God, it's got to be 30, how long, Marshall? 32 years? Maybe more? Uh, and, and similarly, just so you're aware, but the the various revenue authorities, uh, people working at the revenue authorities, have their own associations, and they have their own association meetings, and they exchange a lot of information at these meetings. They're not supposed to exchange about specific taxpayers, uh, but uh, I've always had the feelings otherwise about that. But that's merely speculation. I've never attended one of the meetings, so I can't tell you all my personal knowledge of that. Uh, as far as the after industry-wide exchange programs. Uh, there's simultaneous examination, and there's also simultaneous criminal investigations uh, that occur. Uh, these are uh, uh, programs involved where U.S. US and the treaty partner are examining uh, one taxpayer or a group of taxpayers, and they have simultaneous examinations going on with exchange, of, exchange information going, going back and forth. Uh, they develop, uh, they discuss what their issues are going to be, they develop uh, uh, compatible audit plans, and uh, they also develop what they think their respective information needs are in, in regard to their uh, in, in regard to their domestic their, their loan law. Um, the ex this sort of exchange information has a team approach. There's field personnel. There's U.S. tax attaches involved. There's foreign officials to present proposals to foreign competent authorities. Uh, evaluation of the proposals from foreign competent authorities, and there's other uh, methods they use to facilitate the exchange information between government, uh, which may be appropriate for each country to examine. Uh, so these are not done in a vacuum, and um, it may be a little time consuming, a bit awkward, uh, but there are, we do see more and more uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, of this exchange information. Uh, And finally, under the uh, large and mid-sized business structure now, uh, they can provide technical support with regard to exchanges of information. Um, it should be noted that, uh, that under the, these things, I'm not going to go into detail, but I, I think we've all recognized that domestic source information will be exhausted before they go to national sources. And, and 
it, it should be realized that exchange of competent authority channels can result and, and, and may very well result in unauthorized disclosure of tax information. Um, and uh, that can happen. So um, I think it's just something we all should realize is a practical issue. Um, the information that can be exchanged under these TIEAs as part of these procedural programs, where they're subjective, uh, is, is information pertaining to the processing of double taxation cases. Or there's information that's exchanged on a regular or routine basis uh, based on the, inf on the information returns that are filed. Uh, information related to a specific taxpayer or tax matter under review. Uh, and also, there's exchange information uh, between the authorities as to changes in the tax law. So just because uh, you may think that everybody's up to date, uh, but there are these, uh, under these uh, information exchange provisions, there's also a uh, exchange of, uh, of, of tax law that each side should be aware of. So there's a lot of cooperation among the, uh, among the, uh, among the authorities. Uh, as far as confidentiality, disclosure, and treaty secrecy, uh, I think uh, it, um, as the context with the foreign government, uh, the, um, the Internal Revenue Service provides its guidelines to its examining agents, called international agents, uh, that no IRS employee should make direct contact with a foreign official, tax official, without first contacting the jurisdictional tax attaché, that's the IRS tax attaché, or the exchange of information team. Uh, if a foreign official directly contacts an IRS off it, that is someone picks a phone all of a sudden you're sitting at an IRS agent sitting and all of a sudden gets a, a call from some revenue authority in, in one of the one of the other countries, uh, that uh, he's not to be answering and he's supposed to refer that uh, directly to the uh, IRS tax attaché or to the uh, the exchange of information team. As far as uh, overseas operations and exchange or, there's an exchange of, of information team for foreign operations. Uh, they provide assistance in the foreign countries uh, and the uh, agents are advised to contact uh, the head of the uh, exchange of information team leader uh, when there's no IRS tax attaché assigned to a foreign country where the records are located. Uh, these requests must be in writing. Uh, there's a spe specific list of the information that needs to be given in these requests you can, that, are, that are available. You know, the taxpayer, the years involved, general information about the case, location information. Uh, name, telephone of the requester, uh, address is where the reply has to be gotten to, and then any applicable law, court case, revenue authority, statute, uh, and similar information. Uh, that also has to be provided in the, in the written exchange information. Uh, as to foreign if, if initiated specific requests, uh, and similarly as, as under, the, under foreign programs, uh, these have to be received in writing. Uh, the information, specifically specific taxpayers, is on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's no standing uh, 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 procedure whereby someone's name's on a, on a blacklist, as Marshall talked about, blacklist, and, and just every time he, every time that name comes up, in, in, he's, he's going to be reported uh, automatically in that regard. But it's, but specifically, uh, if, if the if one treaty country wants nation about a specific taxpayer, they make a specific request on a case-by-case -case basis. And then that's responded to, rather than just have a blanket, every time you see something with this guy's name on it, uh, uh, it's reported. Although there may be a, pr a, a procedure uh, in general exchange where that information on, on a group of taxpayers or in an industry or an area uh, where there's an a, a industry-wide request, that will be routinely then sent over to from one revenue authority to another. Uh, there are special procedures for the small business self-employed cases, and there's different procedures for the large and medium-sized uh, business cases. Um, as far as uh, uh, I think what's critical, uh, an area which I just want to skip over a lot of stuff, I want to talk about trade secrets. Because uh, the, probably the great wealth of a, of a, of a company these days may not be in, in in its plant or even its even actually it's the computers themselves, but it's the information that's in the computers and and, and uh, the patents they hold and other uh, trade secret you know uh, such things as uh, manufacturing methods and uh, formulas 
uh, which aren't available to in, in general. So the uh, the Internal Revenue Service is is uh, is uh, agents are are are, are warned as to the non-disclosure of any trade, business, industrial, commercial, or professional secret or process. Uh, if there is some sort of disagreement between the Internal Revenue Service and a third-party requester, uh, the, uh, the, 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 they, there are specific procedures uh, going back to, actually back to 1977, uh, which, the, which have to be followed then. So I'm not going to go into the rev procs. Uh, but just in general, so you're aware of these procedures, provide guidance for requesting information to U.S. competent authority uh, to determine the availability to a U.S. taxpayer of the benefits and safeguards uh, so that th these trade secrets in general uh, can be protected from disclosure. Uh, obviously, there's a concern, uh, for example, in the United States that there may be a request by a third country which is acting on behalf of another country. Uh, this is... Uh, um, has been reported, for example, in the case of uh, uh, the Chinese looking information and using countries uh, as a blind to make requests on information and, and, and as trade secrets and, and other information which they wouldn't generally uh, get available to them. So uh, certainly the Internal Revenue Service is aware of the fact that they may be, uh, uh, may be a, a being used uh, for other purposes and uh, the tax authorities are, are directed to provide uh, safeguards for this. Um, as far as uh, simultaneous examinations, which occur uh, uh, in the in the multi uh, multinational setting quite often, uh, when a, a case is accepted for simultaneous uh, examination, uh, the competent authorities exchange writings and, and identify the designated representatives will have, then have the functional responsibility for directing that, country, that country's examination. So this is go, again goes through a very formal procedure and then down to designated persons uh, who, have, who have been given written authority. Uh, these meetings uh, uh, will be coordinated between the, uh, uh, the various uh, uh, competent authorities through the Office of Director International LMSB, that's large and mid-sized uh, business. So as I mentioned, went right from the start. The new designations of the organization, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, besides using uh, letters, actually is quite critical because, based on this new simplified or this new organization, that that's how the the actual authority of the Internal Revenue Service and Congress through the IRS is, is handled. So, uh, the meetings uh, between these in, in the conduct of a simultaneous examination can take place. Uh, both in the United States and in the foreign country. Uh, therefore, the U.S. Uh, designated representatives uh, will be taking uh, meetings. Uh, should, should and This is the interesting part, uh, which I always found amusing in the manual, is that the, uh, the agents who are taking part of these meetings uh, are advised officially uh, that they have to obtain U.S. passports. Uh, I know this sounds a little funny, and I always, I always find it humorous, uh, but uh, not only is there a, 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 a great number of, of um, people in the United States who don't have passports, that is most people in the United States just don't think that other, other countries really exist very much, they don't really think about having a passport, uh, but there's a large amount of the Internal Revenue Service uh, personnel, even those dealing in the international arena, and they don't have passports either. So uh, I remember I remember one time sitting back and I was discussing, we were, I think it was on the phone, I think Marshall, uh, Professor Langer was with me, and we had some pe somebody in who was talking about, we were discussing about some uh, uh, international where, where they were involved in some sort of transaction. We talked about our traveling, I think maybe a trip back and forth from Dubai. Uh, and uh, and the, 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 the gentleman we were talking to, I, I remember telling me, he says, oh, yes, me and my missus, we travel all over. Well, they were from, uh, I think, from Delaware. He says, we, they told us, we travel all over. Well, we've been to New York and we've been to Chicago. We've been all over. So... <laughs> Yeah, that being some of the more sophisticated business in the United States, you can imagine that the internal revenue hiring employees uh, may not have uh, initially that level any, any level of success. So they are admonished uh, that uh, in the event they're going to take uh, um, take meetings which are going to take place in a foreign country, uh, they are told that they better make sure they get a U.S. passport uh, before they try and leave up to the to, to take the meeting. Uh, 
in, 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 in the exchange information and simultaneous examination, uh, taxpayers uh, uh, may resist information requests and they want, may want to put uh, conditions on how they will disclose information. Uh, the managers and examiners from the Internal Revenue Service are advised that they're going to reject any such conditions and restrictions and should not give any assurances that information will not be exchanged or the taxpayer will be consulted before any exchange. So if you're meeting with an agent says, oh, don't worry, I'll give you plenty of notice, or, or oh, it'll, it'll only be this file will never leave my desk, uh, they do not have authority, uh, they do not have authority to do that, and be assured that anything uh, that can be known, that winds up in the hands of, of, of a revenue agent, uh, will be known and can be exchanged. Um, the Internal Revenue Service, as well as other, other authorities, takes position that uh, any assurance given by any agent is not binding on, the, on e either the IRS or the U.S. Competent Authority. It, unless, of course, uh, it has been specifically signed off on uh, by an international territorial man manager and council. So if you do get some sort of agreement, you darn well better make sure uh, that the person signing the agreement has been designated to have the authority to actually execute that agreement. And it, it happens more than once uh, where agreements get signed and later on we, we find to dismay and have to tell your client or the, the taxpayer uh, that the agreement that you relied on just isn't going to be valid or binding. And um, I'll let your uh, malpractice carrier deal with from there on. Um, let me get to, uh, I'll skip over, let me get to treaty related matters. Uh, more focusing on the treaty, there's the, 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 the IRS uh, in their advice to their agents um, um, just gives them in, in brief, you know, what uh, what sort of treaties there are. Uh, the field director in this regard uh, has a supporting and advisory uh, role and uh, um, he will uh, he will uh, um, deal with the U.S. competent authority um, in terms of the uh, mutual exchange of information. Um, they will f they will forward the exchange report uh, to a, uh, to, a uh, to a to the competent authority whenever requested. Um, there's a provision which I always found kind of interesting for accelerated competent authority procedure, uh, which isn't well known. Uh, that is. The, from the IRS point of view, we, we, there are certain there there are there are at least three areas uh, where there are three procedures whereby uh, tax controversies, controversies which which are, are, are readily apparent uh, by one one side or the other uh, can be resolved uh, before there's a, a full blown conflict. And one of these things is in the is in this uh, area uh, uh, which you should be aware of, which is the accelerated competent authority procedure. Uh, which is used by taxpayers for resolving issues already under competent authority consideration that recur in subsequent years. So a lot of times you'll have an issue pop up, and this happens fairly regularly. Uh, you've had a discussion with it. It's been decided. It's going to pop up next year. You want to discuss this again with the Internal Revenue Service. So when it pops up and, and the return is picked for, for, for examination again because it falls within these the guidelines, which I mentioned uh, there are specific guidelines for classification of returns, uh, that issue is already agreed to and resolved. So you don't have year by year by year going through this laborious procedure uh, of submitting documents and having these audits go on, uh, time and expense when, he, when this issue has already been resolved once and, and, and the Internal Revenue Service or whatever revenue authority uh, will agree that that's a decision on the issue and it will be binding for future subsequent years. Um, There are, is in, along those lines, uh, uh, since Section 32, which we call intercompany pricing, and virtually uh, all the industrial, all the all the OECD countries uh, have uh, this is part of their uh, part of their their their, their, their tax process their, and, and their treaty process, uh, which is going to be uh, dealing with intercompany pricing problems, um, and I think it's going to get worse as time goes on uh, because I think we have to face the fact that as, as a um, as a uh, basic fact, we were dealing with an income tax system that was really designed somewhere in the late 1890s 
uh, adopted by the United States in 1913 and other countries early on. And it really doesn't work very well in a globalized economy, uh, particularly when it's hard, for example, like with the current discussion going on about what is a U.S. auto manufacturer, it's hard to determine what is a U.S. car for purposes of, of uh, the bailout, for example. So what is U.S., what is foreign, you know, what, what products are made where, how you cost them, how you price them uh, is a great difficulty. Uh, there is a procedure uh, called a, a, to receive what's called an advance pricing agreement, uh, which some practitioners are not aware of, in fact most are not, uh, but that's an agreement between the service and the taxpayer and they decide on a, a transfer pricing method. Now, I think, you know, it, it's a, just for purposes of this discussion in, in a few seconds, uh, there are different, five different pr transfer pricing methods. In general, there's one, two, three, four, and then there's something called other, uh, because <clears throat> it's hard to, uh, let me just give you an example of what the difficulty is. Uh, if we're looking at the price of an automobile of a fully integrated automobile company, that is, it has its own coal mines, it has its own steel mines, it has its own steel smelter, uh, it has its, its own glass company, uh, it owns its own radio company, the cost of building, building a car may be looked at differently than if you have a car company which outsources everything and buys it from third party, uh, other third party manufacturers. Uh, it may be a different pricing uh, price of the car if they blend in the overhead of a car company plus its finance company, and you have the overhead which is shared between the two of them versus some some company which just manufactures cars and does not have a financing or other component which generates income or spreads out the the expenses of the general overhead. So that in terms of the transfer pricing method is difficult even when you're talking about organizations in the same industry. Uh, because they vary, uh, every business varies so greatly. So uh, there are detailed um, uh, requirements uh, on the part of the Internal Revenue Service where they request very detailed, detailed information. Probably, likely, nothing the, the companies have normally readily available. Uh, but if they're going to be going into and, re and, and recognizing that it's going to have uh, uh, intercompany pricing problems, uh, then what needs to be done is develop all this information, have files of all this information, uh, develop a, uh, a, 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 a intercompany pricing uh, report, uh, usually done by your auditors or th third party accountants, and then be prepared to establish it. I, I recognize this uh, coming years ago, uh, before I became a lawyer, when I was, uh, when I was a CPA working for a, a, one of the, at that time it was called Big Eight Firms, uh, no, which I don't think people, most people Realized there were at one time eight, actually actually eight large uh, eight large auditing companies, and we had to produce what something called the cost uh, justification defense under the Robinson Patent Act, which apparently which essentially said uh, that um, after the fact uh, you have to prove up why you charge certain costs, and of course they had that information in, in their files because a lot of times costs are not based on just the hard costs; they're based on a lot of market factors. For example, if you have a German comp company which has produce the product, they're selling some widget into the United States, and uh, that widget now has become somewhat obsolete, they may continue selling that widget, losing money, but they want to maintain their dealer network. So deciding what the cost is for purposes of this intercompany pricing has always been a difficulty uh, because there are so many other factors other than what's pure direct cost. There's direct cost, indirect cost, and other industry and marketing factors which you have to take into account. That information, by the way, is information that will be requested uh, when, when a 42 examination is taking place. So for people, for people advising companies who are involved in uh, uh, intercompany inter, 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 inter uh, transfers, uh, it's best to spend a lot of time beforehand, have all the information in the file, rather than trying to chase it around later on, uh, which may be a great difficulty. Uh, the a, the uh, advanced pricing agreement uh, is a way of a, a sort of a, uh, of dealing with a lot of these issues um, to get a, 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 an agreement as to how, what method you're going to use and, and uh, how, it'll, how, how it, uh, and of course then, you know, what profits are going to flow under what, what treaties uh, will come into effect. So that's how it plays into the treaty network is when you're working on a number where you talk about allocation of profits, the question is what profits and where? And then you, then you can apply the treaty to see 
where the treaty is going to allow benefits or not benefits, and who's going to or, or, or allocate sources or, or or allocate other things that are, are covered under the treaty, including may very well be an agreement which might, would impact their limitation of benefits. Uh, the LLB uh, article in most U.S. treaties, uh, some of these objective tests which we've been over, uh, or safe harbors. They also contain subjective tests, uh, which provides that a resident not otherwise to the benefit, uh, otherwise entitled benefit convention, can be granted certain benefits, uh, but you have to have a consent to the this determination uh, by, by by revenue. So, these procedures uh, whereby a, a, an advanced pricing agreement uh, is gotten may impact a lot of the areas of, of the treaty. Um, There are uh, special procedures for tax avoidance cases. Uh, tax avoidance is a, a hot area of controversy. I think that uh, we've all discussed it in any meetings that there are there's legitimate tax avoidance. Uh, there is uh, tax evasion, and then there's a something called now which is avoidion, which is sort of a combination of tax avoidance and tax evasion. It's something in between. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service and other uh, other revenue authorities do not like in between. They tend to look at these things very harshly. Uh, you, just so you're aware, of, there was a, a recent Supreme Court case. I could just bring this to your attention, uh, which you may not be aware of, uh, called Michael Bulworth, uh, which was delivered uh, by the Supreme Court of the United States, March 3, 2008. Uh, it's called it's a case number 06-1509. Essentially, a uh, a, 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 a taxpayer was charged with the constructive receipt of, of, of income uh, because there was a constructive dividend from his corporation. That could be a multinational corporation, the same thing would arise. That is, uh, he was uh, essentially, I think, paying for his girlfriend and other personal expenses and then uh, uh, taking those as distributions to the, co the company. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service uh, said he was evading tax. Um, uh, because of this constructive uh, distribution under the uh, under a certain section of the code, uh, what the what the uh, uh, what the what the internal review what the uh, Supreme Court actually has finally decided uh, what the code sections actually mean what they say, and although there was a constructive distribution, uh, the fact that under this particular scenario the distributions that came from the corporation the corporation didn't have any earnings and profits. And if it didn't have any earnings or profits, then it can't have a taxable distribution. The IRS and, and several appellate courts have always upheld the proposition that you could be guilty of evasion uh, without there having to be a tax bill. Uh, what the Supreme Court said was, uh, uh, was that in order to assess someone with tax evasion, there actually, in fact, has to be a tax report, or a tax bill. Um, as, uh, uh, this, as, as in a concurrence by Justice Thomas, um, he noted that a prior case uh, that, a that a defendant may be criminally sanctioned for tax evasion without owing a penny in taxes to the government. What he said was that, he said, not only indicates a logical fallacy, but is a flat contradiction with the tax evasions statute requirement. Now, I, 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 we all joke around the fact uh, occasionally it's a cocktail talk about, gee, someone's going to get indicted and they didn't owe any tax. Uh, well, there have courts upheld that, and the finally Supreme Court said you can't do that. Uh, what the uh, what the what the court has had did have uh, which which is I think is interesting is they gave as their explanation uh, that uh, that the uh, that that um, a given result at the end of a straight path is not a different result by following a devious path. That is, if 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 you do it the straight way or you do it a squirrely way, if you get to the same result, that there's no tax due. There's not going to be any tax due, and just because the the revenue authority, uh, particularly the IRS, doesn't like the method you use to get there, doesn't uh, change the fact that there that if there's no tax due, there can't be tax evasion, uh, and, and that goes to one of the areas that uh, that follows under these these procedures, uh, under these tax avoidance cases, and where the internal revenue officer decides that there's some method that is being used that they feel is avoiding tax. Uh, and it may tend to, we have these concerns when they hit with tax avoidance, of course, 
Uh, there's the concern also that there's going to be a referral for tax evasion. Uh, this particularly can, ar can arise in the in Section 42, where you're running transactions through multiple subsidiaries in multiple countries. Um, there are uh, there are provisions, of course, for the taxpayers to to uh, to agree with these uh, uh, findings. There's, and I, but I would I would encourage everybody who has a a question uh, in these in the international area uh, as to the uh, uh, some international transaction. If there's some question about it. Uh, to try to enter into, uh, enter into an agreement with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, let me quickly go over to that there's some audit guidelines I think that uh, that, are, that are, are critical. You understand that the Internal Revenue Service just doesn't have someone, agent sitting there who is all powerful, all omnipotent. Uh, there are guidelines. They do, have to, they do have to follow these. However, there are procedures in place, uh, which when you read through are, are so, actually somewhat limited uh, of how they can obtain uh, information uh, if the taxpayer doesn't want to turn over a, a foreign-based taxpayer. Uh, there are lots of changes that, that are taking place in the international rea, arena. They have tremendous impact on the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, although Congress passes these plethora of, uh, and other revenue authorities, Germany comes to mind particularly, uh, and England, which changes their law you know, every time they have, a, they have their budget, uh, makes it very difficult on, on examining agents at, a low, at the lowest level to actually follow along what the current law is. It's hard to keep up. Uh, especially with the complexity of, of not only the law but also the, the businesses or transactions they're applying to. So these, with the and with the globalization uh, of business, both products and services, uh, this the, the the IRS recognizes also there is an increased opportunity uh, for both tax evasion uh, and tax avoidance, uh, both of which uh, they examine very they want to examine very closely. Uh, so these uh, these to, to deal with this, uh, uh, there are uh, a, a what's called the International Enforcement Program, uh, which gives guidelines to the, uh, the international agents uh, in, in order to enforce uh, looking into uh, books, records, or other information that may be available. And if they can't, the the, the guidelines uh, talk about how an agent can go about getting possession. Of books, records, and other information. So there are procedures for, for locating records outside the United States. Uh, that is, you can, that is, the agents told to just request the taxpayer, please give me the information. Uh, a, a summons in the United States can only be enforced against the person who actually has the books and records. Uh, giving someone a summons and, and, and putting them uh, subject to some sort of liability. Uh, or, 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 or uh, enforcement and then a later contempt by a court uh, is not uh, applicable if someone actually doesn't have any possession of, of books and records. So this has occurred, for example, uh, in a number of cases where, where beforehand someone had transmitted, before there was an audit, had, had all their books and records held uh, by, a, by, by, a, by, a, by a foreign party or sometimes by their, by their attorney. And uh, when the summons came, they did not, they did not uh, uh, have the books and records, uh, and therefore they can't turn over what they don't have. So uh, uh, the, the agents are advised that if you want to give someone a summons, uh, ex expect that it's only going to be uh, effective for someone who, in, in fact, has possession, physical possession of books, records, and the information you want. All requests have to be in, in writing. So that having a phone call from so one of the from, from one agent who tells you, you know, send me over this stuff isn't good enough. Uh, demand everything. Everything should be in writing. The agents are required to put things in writing, and you shouldn't respond to anything if it's not in writing. If, if, if the taxpayer is unwilling or unable to uh, furnish records, uh, then the if the agent uh, can uh, examine or go to the foreign country and examine the records which may be on site. Uh, this involves uh, another whole set of procedures of, of, uh, of actually getting, uh, getting uh, uh, invited to visit the site and then, adv getting, then advising the foreign government uh, that you'll be uh, coming there um, on revenue business and, and getting the permission of the foreign government to then uh, go on site. Now, this, this happened in a case uh, that we were involved in some years ago in which there was a, uh, a, a little electric auto manufacturer is uh, ma manufacturing in, in one of the islands, 
and the uh, there was an audit on, and um, uh, during the course of uh, later tax uh, litigation and tax court, uh, certain information was 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 obtained, uh, which was attempted to be pr pr provided to the into the court as evidence, and. Um, when questioned about that, the agents just happened to say, "Well, uh, that they got this from somebody else." It just so happens that uh, that the uh, security cameras at the plant uh, picked up on uh, on their uh, on video uh, the agent himself uh, standing in blue shorts and a t-shirt, peering over the fence, taking the pictures, which were attempted to be submitted into the tax court. And uh, and when that was later uh, brought to the attention of the court. Uh, the uh, the district council the case says, well, he was on vacation. He wasn't really there on official business, and this this would obviously not have any relevance to the tax court case. I want to tell you that the that eventually the, the case was dismissed out. What, what we did was, uh, I had a client who had a fifty million dollar assessment. The, uh, the 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 trial was going to be a two three week trial. One week into the trial, after this occurred, uh, we had a settlement in the case. Which uh, they settled with us uh, as to a, and we, we took a twenty thousand uh, dollar T and E, that's a, a, a travel entertainment charge, against a company that was held that we that the client held in Puerto Rico, which in fact had already been dissolved. So uh, it, it, it's important to be aware of that that the that the Internal Revenue Service uh, has to follow some sort of procedures, uh, and and uh, and you should be aware of what they are to properly advise your clients, um, and uh, whether it's a Tax treaty, when, especially when there's a tax treaty in place, uh, and they're obtaining, trying to get information under the treaty uh, themselves, then they have to deal through the competent authorities. And uh, being on a self-help program is is not permitted. Um, as far as, uh, as the the international agents are, are required, they they want to know, make sure that all the procedures uh, that they use are supposed to be uniform. So you'll have one case from one agent. Uh, will be handled exactly the same by another case in another in, in another situation. That is usually you'll see what's called an information document request. That's uh, form forty five sixty four. Uh, usually it's a, it's in multiple pages. There's just listing all the information they want. Uh, they set they usually set an initial time to produce that, uh, which is short. Uh, and and uh, the agents and and and, and the practitioners should keep detailed records of any conversations and. Uh, uh, any any history uh, that goes on back and forth, specifically uh, as to documents which are turned over to this uh, under this information document request. Uh, as far as summons are concerned, uh, let me put this to you in a very general way. There's things which are called friendly summons. That is a summons which is issued by the agent himself, uh, and, and, and the the person having books, records, or other information is then then requested. To provide to the agent, those su summons aren't yet enforceable. Uh, in fact, it's more or less a voluntary. They get enforceable in fact when the Department of Justice Tax Division comes in, goes to court, and obtains a court order enforcing the summons. Now, it's not uh, an unusual situation. For an agent to issue a summons, which is I refer to as what I think in colloquial terms called a friendly summons, and later on, if there's noncompliance, they go to the Department of Justice Tax Division, and, and, and for whatever reason internally, uh, the, um, the trial lawyers just decide they're not going to take the case up. Now, that doesn't happen all the time, but it happens occasionally. So you should be aware that uh, just receiving a summons uh, doesn't, doesn't have quite the same weight as when you get a summons with a court order behind it. I think you should recognize that uh, particularly there's a, a great deal of information uh, that's required uh, before, for, before issuing a summons and specifically in, in all the, the areas which, are, which would involve uh, 42 classification, international classification, there's a great deal of foreign corporations, uh, foreign tax credits is a particular bugaboo for the Internal Revenue Service and they have de detailed guidelines for that. Uh, what's called three six section three sixty seven issues that transfers to or, or by a foreign corporation uh, has very detailed uh, checklists of what the agents are supposed to be ask, asking for and, and, and finally I think what uh, since we're looking at the fact that probably anywhere between forty and sixty percent of any 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 investment by foreigners into real estate worldwide 
uh, as about 40 to 60 percent of that really comes into the United States, uh, being aware that there's a special separate tax act dealing with foreign investment into real estate property, uh, which may apply to what's with property interests, um, leaseholds that are under 30 years, and, and, and lots of other areas, uh, should be aware of uh, when, er when any, any type of, of planning is, is concerned under the treaty area. And these must take into account because many times these provisions of the code sections override the provisions. And they, and they may override treaty provisions in other countries. So you have to both be aware of what the treaty provisions are, what the code provisions in the respective countries are, and which one overrides which one a, 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 a simultaneously. So this area of international planning uh, certainly has its, it has, its, it has, its, uh, has its difficulties, uh, but thank goodness uh, there are a, a lots of clients out there uh, willing to pay significant fees for us to do our job and advise them. And I am, at this time, very happy that they are. Um, William, I think that, that, that in short covers the area. I think I wanted to be aware of, of everybody uh, that, this, uh, that there's a procedural aspect to all this treating, treaty planning besides the subject of law, which, which in, many, in many times or most times uh, equals or exceeds uh, the difficulty of just understanding what the, tr the treaty's uh, subjective law on their face is. And that's what we have for today, and thank you very much. 100%. 100%. Thank you very kindly for, uh, for, uh, for that most interesting, that most interesting lecture, lecture to close out our, our international, international tax, tax and, and uh, um, the tax treaty course. course. I have a few announcements. Have announcements. Dennis, would you turn Dennis, off your locked button, your locked button? Uh, so it doesn't echo? Button. Echo. How's it? Right. 100%. Great. Um, the. Uh, I especially liked your comment about the agent peering over with the uh, camera in uh, in Bermuda. But uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So uh, I thank you very kindly. It is, but it was one of the islands. <laughs> Bermuda shorts gives a uh, little hint. <laughs> but um, the uh, uh, next semester, for those of you who enjoy uh, Professor Kleinfeld and and uh, in Marsh Langer's uh, lectures. They'll both be lecturing in the International Offshore Financial Centers course. So if you uh, are interested in the offshore, um, you will have them and their colleague, uh, Stephen Gray, I believe, will also be lecturing in that course. Finally, uh, and George Salas will be doing the paperwork in the, um, in the uh, uh, asynchronous chat rooms. Um, okay, announcements for the rest of the semester, important announcements. Uh, number one, I made it at the beginning, I'll make it now, but you won't hear it again. If you aren't going to submit some assignment by the end of the semester, which is in a week, i.e., you're going to be late, you're going to get an F unless you check with your instructor. All you got to do is check with the instructor and set a date when you're going to have the assignment in. If not, they have to fill in their grade sheet because we, the registrar's office, has been pressing them to get grades in on time. It's a very simple process. All you do is tell the instructor, set up a date in the future. If it's going to be after the grade sheet is due, you're going to get a withdrawal until you submit your, uh, your assignments. It's solely up to the instructor. Don't contact him after the grade sheet's in. It's too late. It's out of his or her hands. Number two. This is the last lecture for international tax and tax treaties. You may have other lectures scheduled with other instructors. I'm not following every class's lecture schedule. By example, civil tax procedure or tax one or what have you. In career services, you have, I was looking at the calendar, it's not three, you have four. Four lectures, like next Friday the 18th, you have two lectures, one at uh, 9 o'clock Pacific time, one at 11 o'clock Pacific time. Um, uh, anyway, check your calendar for December in Career Services. There are several other lectures from recruiters, KPMG, Ernst, blah, blah, blah. Finally, um, if you have not registered for classes, I'm leaving on Monday morning at 6 a.m. I will not be back until orientation because when I do come back, I have the AALS I'll be attending here in San Diego with all the other law faculty. Hester here until next Thursday. If you don't have your registration in by next Thursday, 
you're probably going to be starting classes late then, um, if, if there's room. We are maxing out class enrollment at 15. There's not going to be any more uh, students in 15 because we're going to be rolling out the new um, uh, software also. And, uh, and so we'll have a mega meeting and we'll have that uh, fancy polycom system for, uh, for some classes so that you can test out your own audio differences. Probably, I'm going to suspect we're going to stick with, uh, with mega meeting for most of it though. Um, having said this, we have to maximize, have a maximum limit of 15 a class if we're going to test out um, that software and other things. Okay, so if you haven't registered, get in contact with Hester. She's here in the office, and, uh, and that's my last announcement. Are there any questions you need for the end of the semester since tomorrow is effectively my last day in the office? I will be around on Saturday, but uh, I will be cleaning up my mess and grading my assignments. Okay, Rinaldi had his email assignments. I'll open a Dropbox for tax trees for Prof. Rinaldi. I thought there was a Dropbox. Regardless, he's grading those assignments. I, I saw that he had sent out comments on, on those, but I'll open up a Dropbox anyway. Scott G., he's from Mega Meeting, will be troubleshooting with you to deal with your audio problems. Yeah, you're supposed to email him the assignments directly. That's correct. And he has provided you feedback directly. I saw some students talking about the feedback he had provided, so I am sure that he has already done that. Uh, okay, 100%. So his grades will be factored into the class grades. For international tax, your grades are by uh, Prof. Andrews, and everybody should have made a presentation for that class, I believe. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, I'm gonna at least I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>